Hi, I'm Chris Ballinger, and uh, one of my jobs is thinking about blockchain distributed ledgers and related technologies, and thinking about how they might apply in the automotive industry. I began thinking about the need for uh, the industry to share driving data. I, I, we talk about the trillion kilometer challenge, which is the need for massive amounts of data and, and rich uh, data on uh, driving patterns around the world, how people drive uh, events, corner cases. Uh, it will take an enormous amount of data to produce a safe autonomous vehicle. Uh, and if we can do that quicker, we can save potentially a million plus lives a year. But no auto company, no single entity has the ability to get to a trillion kilometers of driving data anytime soon. We're just beginning to harvest the data. And so uh, the, I began interested, became, became interested in the idea of what a marketplace for data would look like, under what conditions would companies share data. And of course, nobody is willing to share data because it's their secret sauce. It's how they're going to get there first. It's their competitive advantage. However, uh, a marketplace might allow companies to source data from other folks who have it, fleets, uh, perhaps companies that might have drivers or driving data but aren't developing an autonomous car itself, or even companies that have maybe an equal amount of driving data that might be willing to share. And the problem is nobody's willing to do that unless they can control their data. Right? It's the tragedy of the digital commons that uh, data, when it gets out there, right, is lost, uh, its uh, uh, property rights don't exist, uh, and there's no business model that exists because the, uh, there's no ability to capture and harvest it. And so uh, in thinking about this problem, I think I, I began researching on the, the internet, of course, uh, which is what everybody does when they have a problem they don't know the answer to these days, and uh, was lucky enough to find some blogs from Trent. Uh, I thought he was uh, thinking about this problem of data sharing and the data commons in very interesting ways. And I think I reached out to, uh, to, to Big Chain and got an answer back from Bruce fairly quickly. We began talking about the problem and what we wanted to do, what Big Chain was working on, and found out very quickly that there was uh, an interesting convergence of the ways we were thinking about the problems and possible solutions. One of the things that got me interested in thinking about it was hearing about the Open Music Initiative, right, which is a very similar problem. Right. The problem is digital rights, and digital content. Once something is out there, you can't stop somebody else from sampling, using it, uh, taking it, appropriating it, expropriating it. And uh, if you can um, uh, register something, uh, point to it, uh, establish provenance, uh, and, and agree up front uh, to operate within that framework, uh, then you can track, uh, control, uh, potentially, uh, your own data uh, and its use versus uh, a, 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 a free commons, previous, the previous uh, situation. So when I began to think about what was going on in the music industry and their problem in controlling digital content and rewarding content creators, it seemed like a similar problem. Uh, and, uh, and, and one that was perhaps amenable to a, a blockchain solution. You know, they seemed like they'd made a fair amount of progress on it and it was worth exploring whether the same type of approach would work for driving data. Uh, AI will impact every sector uh, and all aspects of our lives. Uh, it already is. Uh, the most obvious one in the auto industry is the autonomous car itself. Right? Uh, the, the autonomous car is an AI. It is an AI robot. Right? It is AI, right, which is the way the car drives around without a human driver. Right? It is the intelligence that's not a human uh, that's, that's protecting the occupants. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's all of the classic uh, uh, cutting edge uh, uh, features of AI which are needed in the automotive industry. Right? The, and beginning with the, the, the deep learning, the massive amounts of data uh, that will be used to create the 
uh, the, the agent that can protect you. Uh, the cars that are driving around today, uh, there's lots of hype about their capabilities. Uh, cars have been released uh, that have autonomous capabilities. Uh, and uh, they, they don't generally work very well except under ideal conditions. Uh, uh, if you have a road with no shoulder, lots of bushes right on the edge of the road, oncoming traffic, lots of curves, uh, and you rely on the, uh, the self-driving features to protect you, you probably will be in trouble very quickly, uh, which is why that, that every system that's out there requires a human driver to sit there like this with their hands an inch away from the wheel because that's really the only safe thing is to have the human driver, right? It's not autonomous at all. It's, uh, it, it's autonomous uh, except in a half second you're going to have to take it back and, and, and drive it. Uh, to get to the point where the car can really drive itself without the human backup, uh, we probably, in, in all conditions, uh, we're probably a ways away from that. Uh, and the, the, the part that's probably the hardest is this intermediate phase where that is going to rely on a human to take over. Uh, because the better the technology gets, the longer right, the, uh, the period is between the human takeover, uh, the more complacent the human gets. Right? This is a real problem. Uh, it's actually called the attention problem. Right? Humans are not very good at keeping their attention right, for long periods of time when nothing is happening. Robots are really good at that. Robots don't lose attention ever. They can go for 100 years and never lose their attention. The problem is um, a, a fatal accident today happens about every 200 million miles. That's a long way. That's obviously much more than an average human lifetime. Uh, and so the average human put in that position right, will say, I don't need to watch. Right? Uh, this is going to be, and the odds are in favor. Right? Uh, of, but, uh, but in aggregate, right, that means a lot of people are going to be getting into some very serious trouble. Uh, and the, the, the problem is, if people don't think they have to watch, uh, the time that it takes to recalibrate, look up, see what the problem is, right? say after there's a warning, uh, uh, could be a very long period of time. Right? It, it could be like 5, 10, maybe even 15 seconds to look up from whatever you were doing, reading a newspaper, immersed in a video game, uh, drinking a martini in the back seat, whatever it was you were doing, uh, to, to retake control of the car, focus your attention, uh, and, and, and make the car, get the car back into a safe mode. It may be that that, that uh, period of time is just too long for the sensors of the car to actually provide that amount of warning. So there may actually not be a very safe place between where we are now and the, the fully autonomous car of the future, fully driven by the AI. So ro roboticists talk about something called the uncanny valley, which is the, if you get something that is human-like, Right, but not perfect, right? It's, people find it disturbing. They call it the uncanny valley. There may be kind of an uncanny valley in autonomous driving as well, which is this period uh, of complacency when people think they're all set, uh, but a dangerous event could really arise because that's the time that uh, the human is gonna be least prepared to take over. The more data they ha that we have, uh, the more uh, drivers, fleet companies, auto companies, those that might have access to rich data, particularly rich data in difficult driving situations. The faster we can amass a, a trillion kilometers of that kind of data, the faster we can all get to the day when a safe uh, autonomous agent can drive us around uh, without us having to uh, be, be constantly uh, uh, available to take the control of the car back. I think it's, it's uh, it's the classic prisoner's dilemma, right, of, of uh, there's a, a common good, uh, a, an optimum solution that uh, is fairly easy to see, uh, but at least today the incentives are, right, to do something else, to hoard our data. And we see that across multiple industries, wherever markets are driven by, uh, by, by uh, 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 data advantages. Uh, the, the, the incentive is to silo the data, protect it, uh, build even more data, create even more of a fortress and not share it with others. And the opportunity here, and I think people are just beginning to realize that there might be a technology that can help, right, that can help us solve the incentives uh, and, and, and release us from the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, I think people are just beginning to realize that the kinds of technologies uh, 
uh, that we're talking about here, uh, uh, being able to uh, protect your data, register your data, uh, control the data, uh, uh, let pieces of it be used under circumstances, under, under a, 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 an enforceable license. Uh, that wasn't technically possible before or with other technologies. Uh, it's still not proven, uh, I think, but uh, at least we see perhaps a light at the end of the tunnel that's, uh, that's, that's interesting and worth exploring. So crypto economics and tokens. Let me not use those words. <laughs> I, I'm an economist by training. Uh, to an economist, right, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. To an economist, everything is incentives. Uh, and what's, what's interesting here is that the ability to create property rights allows you to create the incentives, right, uh, to, to deal with market failures. And ultimately, that's what there is here, right, with, with uh, the, the fact that, that, uh, that, that, that data is uh, once it's created and out there, right, it's, it's, it's uh, you, you no longer, you lose your, your property rights and the incentives that go with it. This is the problem in the music industry. And so it boils down to, uh, to fixing the incentives and correcting the market failure. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the goal is with the data provenance and, and, uh, and, and control, uh, if you can fix the market failures, uh, then you create the incentives to cooperate, uh, to share data, uh, perhaps under you know, terms of license or monetization. But that's the way, generally, right, we, we deal with other goods in the economy, so that's fine. The, the, a, a connected car uh, ha will have an enormous amount of sensors. Uh, if you think about the sensors that are needed to, uh, to keep an autonomous car safe, it's multiple cameras, LIDAR, radar, uh, real-time mapping going on, uh, real-time connections. Um, so uh, massive, massive amounts of data. And the, that data creates a digital exhaust, which is tremendously valuable. Today, uh, cars don't do that. Uh, the, only the bare minimum of, of information flows out of a car, right? Uh, its location and its, its time, its GPS coordinates every 20 or 30 seconds, right? This is a, a breadcrumbing view, right? This is dropping breadcrumbs in the forest. Uh, uh, it's a paucity of data. Uh, that's gonna change very quickly uh, to a data stream that overwhelms the ability of, of existing technologies to even carry it, right? The only way to get the amount of data out of a car that will be produced by the, the, the new rich sensor packages uh, will be uh, you, know, uh, you know sim chips and and uh, parking in front of a uh, a very fast internet connection right it, it cannot flow over the 4g lines or, or or similar technologies that are out there today uh, on the other hand uh, when the technologies come along to move that data right one can imagine entirely new business models to monetize that data let me give you some examples Right, windshield wipers. Right, uh, your ability to weather forecast basically depends on the the density of your weather stations. Right, there's a lot of cars out there. Every time the windshield wipers go on, right, it essentially the speed of the windshield wipers and cars with sensors measure right how much rainfall there is. Right, and so you have very rich, very dense uh, weather stations that would be extremely valuable to weather forecasting companies. All right, maybe that's a you know a fraction of a penny from each windshield wiper sensor, uh, but it's something that can be monetized. What about when a car hits a pothole, right? That's something that would be of interest to the city, right? Uh, much cheaper to pay the car for a fraction of a cent for that information than to send out inspectors to look for potholes to fill. Uh, what about an eyeballs? Uh, well, an autonomous car is going to free up people's time. The car will become the fourth screen, right? And uh, the, those eyeballs uh, and the content right, uh, that they're watching right, will then perhaps prove very valuable. Now, let me give you an analogy. Uh, the internet is worth about $2 trillion. This is the infrastructure, right, the hard infrastructure for the internet. Uh, the auto industry is about $2 trillion. So they're roughly the same scale. Uh, the, inf the, the difference is uh, the infrastructure of the auto industry and transportation is paid for out of car purchases, taxes, right? Uh, 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 and, and, and other exchanges of, of cash. The infrastructure for the internet is paid entirely out of right, the monetization of the eyeballs, is this implied consent 
I look at uh, uh, a screen, I'm trading off the, uh, my willingness to watch a few ads right, for free access to the internet. I don't have to pay anything. All I have to do is, is uh, have some pop-ups, some annoying pop-ups in the corner. And so it, it at least, um, you know, given that there's, uh, that alone is, is roughly equal to the, the, the value of the auto industry today, and then there's all these additional monetization streams on top of it, mobility as a service, the digital exhaust, the eyeballs, right? One can begin thinking about a, uh, a transportation infrastructure that gets very, very cheap to use, right? Maybe, right, for, uh, for certain types of trips or certain parts of the world, uh, maybe even free. And that's tremendously interesting because then you are talking about opening up mobility uh, to a large segment of the world's population that maybe doesn't have very good access to mobility today. Who would that be? Well, it's about 95% of the people in the world can't afford a private car, can't afford to, to ride around in a, an Uber or Lyft in a private trip, which is about the same cost as owning a private car. Uh, these are people who right, uh, maybe uh, we talk about in the sense of being unbanked. That's a, a term that people are familiar with, right? And it's about two billion people, uh, or maybe it's the people who make less than twenty thousand dollars a year, which is about ninety-five percent of the world's population, right? Or something in between those those two estimates. There's a, still a huge population of people who would benefit from cheaper mobility and uh, and an infrastructure which which uh, harvests data and and monetizes eyeballs in order to drive the cost down and make. Uh, mobility accessible. And like the unbanked, right, the idea of trying to get along in the modern world without good access to mobility, right, is, is almost unimaginable, right? Imagine trying to live in a city and find a job across uh, a major you know, mega city in the world today uh, and having to do it with a combination of bicycle walking and, uh, and, you know, maybe four trips on different types of public transportation and spending, you know, two or three hours uh, in each direction of your commute uh, and which time you're going to have to, you know, take a break and carry groceries home, right? all, all through that mess. Uh, it's dangerous. It tends to be cash intensive. It's extremely draining on time. Uh, so there's a lot of room for improvement for that, that large segment of the world's population. Mm -hmm.